their waivers, both for Medicaid and for the Affordable Care Act. And here to discuss those with us, we have an all-star panel. Um, we'll start with Senator Kay Kirkpatrick. Come on up. She's a physician and, uh, of course, a state senator. Uh, Ryan Loke, special projects with the office of Governor Brian Kemp and uh, has had his hands dirty on this waiver question for several months now. And then we have Nina Schaefer from the Heritage Foundation, a health policy analyst there, and someone who just knows this stuff inside and out and can provide a national perspective on what exactly is going on here in Georgia. So just to get, get everybody on kind of the same footing, what is a waiver? Why are we talking about this? So a, a waiver is simply a request that the state makes of the federal government uh, to have some flexibility in how it administers either a federal program or, and or federal dollars. Um, and so as you may know, health care is an area where billions of dollars flow into Georgia um, from federal tax dollars to provide health insurance for uh, thousands and thousands of Georgians. Um, and so both Medicaid and the Affordable Care Act recognized in statute that some states may need to do things a little differently than others. And they included the ability for those states to ask for flexibility again in how those programs are administered. And uh, Georgia under Governor Brian Kemp has decided to take that up. There was legislation earlier this year uh, to uh, give him the authority to pursue those. Um, and, and this is, Medicaid waivers have been around for a long time. With the Affordable Care Act, um, this is something relatively new. The law, of course, is only um, not quite 10 years old, but the, the use of waivers to get flexibility in how the subsidies provided for health insurance under that law are administered is relatively new. We've seen about a dozen states get waivers approved uh, for something called reinsurance. We'll be talking about that. But last year, the Trump administration really sort of um, reframed how these waivers can be used, um, what, the, what the guidelines are, even what some possible concepts for state waivers, what they could be. Um, and we have not seen a state really ask for something beyond reinsurance since that guidance came out last fall. Uh, we are now poised um, to be the first state to do that. And we will see what the reaction from the Trump administration is, but it's certainly an exciting time um, it, when you're in this policy world and looking at health policy to see that Georgia has a, has a chance to be a real national leader on this, to lay out a marker that other states can follow can pick up, can add to, um, and we could eventually see several states really build on this and, and begin to tweak their markets, which have had a lot of trouble, uh, the individual insurance market, under the Affordable Care Act. So um, with all that laid out as a foundation, um, Ryan, if you could start us out, how and why did the Kemp administration decide to embrace not just one, but both of those waivers, because that's also something that is relatively uh, unusual. Sure, thanks Kyle, and, and thanks everybody for being here this afternoon. Um, and I know that ACA waivers and 115 waivers can be a confusing concept, and I'm gonna try and keep it at about 50,000 feet, but if I go down into the weeds, somebody throw something at me and I'll <laughs> shut up. Um, but to answer your question, um, this process really started about 14 months ago um, in September, kind of as the general election um, was heating up and we were sitting in a campaign office um, that was like a former soul cycle office. It was really weird, but an interesting place to bring people together um, and trying to scheme out what then at the time candidate Kemp's health care proposal was going to be. We knew that um, Leader Abrams had been talking about Medicaid expansion and reinsurance and a couple other things, but at that time we didn't really have a clear vision on what we wanted our health care proposal to be. We only had on our website, I think, the ad that the left ran was seven words, and they were about affordability, accessibility, and quality. Um, so we really took those three tenets um, and over the course of several weeks brought dozens of stakeholders into our office um, and worked with members of the General Assembly and leadership to kind of concoct a health care proposal 
that would seek to address um, a coverage gap that exists in Georgia for folks under the poverty level, and then also seek to address the costs of individual market coverage under healthcare.gov. Um, and so by doing that, we, we landed on an 1115 waiver proposal um, and, and a 1332 waiver proposal being combined that eventually translated into Senate Bill 106, um, which we dubbed the Patients First Act. And over the course of several months with Senator Patrick's leadership, the Lieutenant Governor's team and the Speaker's team, uh, we got that bill passed with bipartisan support and, and really began the deep dive policy development process uh, in April of this year. Um, and the goal for both of these waivers, like I said at the beginning, is to kind of address some gaps in costs and coverage that exist for individuals in Georgia presently. You'll see on the screen um, behind you and in front of me that the without waiver scenario, um, as things stand presently, is up top. For folks, for single individuals without children in the state right now, under the poverty level, which is about $12,000 a year, there is no coverage option for them under Medicaid, and most of the time they cannot afford their employer-sponsored plan, whether they're working part-time or doing job training or enrolled in TCSG um, programs, they can't afford their um, employer-sponsored plan or don't have access to one. And so through our 1115 proposal, what we're calling Georgia Pathways, we've sought to close um, that loophole and that gap, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that later. And then you look on uh, the far end, 400% uh, of poverty level for a single individual. Presently, right now, an individual is eligible for a subsidy under the Affordable Care Act if their income is between 100% of poverty and 400% of poverty. It's a sliding scale based on your total household income and caps your maximum um, exposure for costs um, as it rises up the, the scale to 400%. But when you hit 401%, there is a dramatic cliff that exists because a subsidy is no longer eligible. Um, you're no longer able to take, el you're no longer eligible to take advantage of a subsidy, excuse me. Um, and the costs for that are astronomical. We've seen in places in Southwest Georgia, I got back from Bainbridge um, about eight o'clock last night and premiums in Bainbridge are an average of $1,100 per month for an individual. And that's just quite frankly, unacceptable and unaffordable for almost everybody. Um, and so by doing that, we sought to combine both our 1115 proposal, Georgia Pathways, and then our 1332 proposal, which has a component of a reinsurance program that Kyle talked about, as well as our Georgia Access Model, which I'll talk about a little bit later, to smooth the cliff that exists at 400% for individuals buying individual market coverage, and then allow a pathway or an opportunity for folks who are below the poverty level to gain insurance coverage in the state. Right, and so that's... Um that's the overview, and, and to, to keep everybody again on the same page, when Ryan says 1115, he's talking about the Medicaid waiver, and when he says 1332, he's talking about the ACA waiver. Uh, I, I think you also can explain how it how it'll affect families, not just the single. Sure, um, so you'll see here the, the single individuals, the with waiver scenario on the bottom. For a family of four, um, you'll see how this will impact them. Um, the without waiver present day scenario is up top. Again, you have that coverage gap um, for single individuals under poverty, under the poverty line rather, with no dependents. Um, and then the with waiver scenario on the bottom, um, seeking to close that gap that exists, and then also providing a reinsurance program to allow for um, some serious premium reductions um, at the high end of the individual market scale. Okay. So let's assume for today's purposes that these will be approved by the Trump administration. Walk us through, one by one, what the differences we'll see in Georgia from each of these waivers, when, kind of what changes, how they, how they work. Sure, so when is a, uh, is a big question at this point. Um, under 1115 waiver authority, which has been in place since 1965, the federal government does not have a shot clock, if you will, to determine um, whether or not your application is good to go. They will determine that it's complete, and then at which point we will engage in a lengthy negotiation process with the feds um, with the ultimate goal of approval. But there is no shot clock for the 1115 at this point. Um, for the 1332, there is a 180-day shot clock that exists following a federal public comment period. Um, our goal with both of these is to have approval for both Section 1115 and Section 1332 waiver authority. Uh, sometime, I guess that's next fall, which would be at the end of the six-month period for the ACA waiver, um, and then about eight months after 
when we submit um, the 1115 waiver. As it impacts um, kind of everyday hardworking Georgians to steal the, the governor's um, talking points here a little bit, for folks who are below the poverty level, who are working 80 hours a week or enrolled in the TCSG program or part of the high demand career initiative or something like that, um, that don't have access to coverage, we are creating a pathway for them to have access to coverage where a pathway does not exist presently. Either we'll enroll them in the Medicaid managed care program that the state has currently, or if they have access to employer-sponsored coverage and they're working for an employer that provides access to that, we'll enroll them in that plan if it's more cost-effective for the state to do so. Um, for folks buying off the individual market, um, beginning in plan year 2021, which is the next plan year, our goal with the reinsurance program is to see an average 10% reduction in premiums across statewide, which is on the high end of what other states have received approval for under 1332 authority. Um, but in areas like I talked about earlier in southwest Georgia, where you have $1,100 per month premiums on average, um, our goal there is to allow for or create a mechanism whereby those individuals would likely see a 25% reduction in premiums in year one. And we've taken a model similar to what Colorado has just been approved for, where they look at the highest cost areas and provide a higher coinsurance rate or a higher state investment to subsidize those premiums. And our goal there, like I said, is to look at the highest cost areas and drive those premiums down about 25%. Um, the second component to our 1332 waiver is something that no state has tried before and we're excited to be the first state to submit this, we're calling it Georgia Access. Um, and in that, we are trying to, or seeking approval um, from the federal government to limit the state's participation on the federally facilitated exchange known as healthcare.gov. And by doing so, we're creating an environment whereby the private sector through a network of web brokers and insurance carriers can be the no wrong door portals for individual market coverage in this state for individuals seeking to buy coverage. So beginning in plan year 2022, folks who have been purchasing off of healthcare.gov or are going onto healthcare.gov for the first time will be redirected to a landing page on healthcare.gov that says, here are your options for insurance coverage. You could go to eHealth or HealthSherpa, or you could go to Cigna or Aetna or Anthem or so on and so forth down the line, but we're not limiting individuals just to going to healthcare.gov. And like I said, we'll, we'll hopefully get approval for that to begin in plan year 2022. And when they go to those privately operated sites, are they gonna see the exact same plans that they see now? Or are they gonna see more? Will they have more flexibility in which ones they can choose? A absolutely. Um, under our scenario, we are not limiting folks um, from seeing only what's called an ACA qualified health plan under healthcare.gov in this scenario. Um, let's you know lay out an example. If somebody is going to seek individual market coverage for the first time, they go to healthcare.gov in 2022, um, beginning for open enrollment in that period, and healthcare.gov says, listen, you can go to HealthSherpa to find individual market coverage. That individual goes to Health Sherpa, um, and in that Health Sherpa environment, we're creating an experience where the user will see all of the insurance coverage options available to them in this state, rather than being locked into only seeing an ACA qualified health plan under the healthcare.gov scenario. So folks will be able to see your ACA qualified health plans, your short-term plans, catastrophic plans, um, and anything that the state deems as insurance, vision, dental, so on and so forth, and one unique shopping experience. And another kind of interesting factor to this is we're proposing, and we'll, again, we'll be the first state to do this, to allow for the subsidies that I talked earlier for individuals between 100 and 400% to be used for what we're calling non-eligible qualified health plans. And those may be health plans that offer less than the maximum number of essential health benefits required under the ACA, but in order to be eligible for a subsidy, those plans um, have to maintain protections for pre-existing conditions and cannot medically underwrite. And so you'll be able to use a subsidy for more options than you would be able to under the ACA today. Okay, so that's, that's a good overview of what's happening, what's being proposed. So for Senator Kirkpatrick, you know, as a physician, you've seen firsthand the problems we have with healthcare financing, and as a legislator, you were asked to approve this course of action without really knowing how a lot of the details would shake out. So what do you think? Does this meet your expectations? Well, when I first uh, started changing careers and becoming a legislator instead of a doctor, although I'm still a doctor, by the way, um, I was hearing a lot from my constituents in the North Metro area about their 
private insurance. And so small businesses and individuals really have very few choices uh, in the state in general, but in my area specifically, I had a lot of people who were very upset because they did not like any of the plans that were being offered and the ones that there were were extremely expensive. And so I actually went to the governor's office uh, last fall and we talked about the 1332 waiver and I started gathering some information from other states that uh, had been successful with doing a reinsurance program. Because the problem is when the ACA was put in place top down, the, um, some of the carriers left the state. And that left us with very little competition and that made costs go up. And so I think that the combination of the um, waivers is likely going to attract more business back to our state. And in fact, even the conversation has resulted in now two more carriers that have announced that they're gonna be here next year. And so I really think this isn't the only solution. It has to work with other things that we're doing that we can talk about later, but uh, combining this with direct primary care and some other things that are give people more choices, I think is gonna really help. And I think the states are a perfect laboratory for this. I don't think the federal government's really in a position to understand the challenges that different states face. You can look at the VA health system as a great example of that. So I think we do have a good opportunity to innovate here and um, you can have more than one waiver in each category. So we aren't necessarily done with this. This is probably just the beginning. So I'll direct this to Nina. It's, you know, it's easy for us to get hyper-focused on our own state. So give us some national context um, and, and let's first talk about these ACA waivers. You know, why are they important in general and why have some of your colleagues around the country been watching Georgia to see what was gonna happen? Sure, well I think that um, the story you hear in, in Georgia is a similar story we hear nationally. We know that premiums are going up across the country. National premium estimates now are since uh, before the Affordable Care Act to uh, I think it's 2018, premiums have increased by over 100%. Uh, the average um, number of choices that people have during this period have also plummeted, about 50% of fewer ch plan choices that people have. And there's a greater dependence on the safety net. And we know the more people that are depending on the safety net, the weaker the safety net is. Um, so that's really a story that is not unique to Georgia, um, but I think Georgia's bringing a lot of unique things to the table that other states haven't. So Ryan um, has talked about that there have been a lot of states who have used the 1332 waiver to do a reinsurance program. Uh, it started on, this was, you know, in, written in the statute, so it was actually began during the Obama administration. Uh, but when the Trump administration came, they kind of streamlined the process a little bit more and they got more states to apply for the reinsurance mechanism. And in those states, they've seen their premiums drop um, significantly in some instances, I think up to 20% in some states. Uh, the interesting piece on that, too, is it's not just a red state. You would think, oh, gosh, this must be, you know, Trump came in and all these red states did this. It wasn't. It was actually blue states with some red states. So you had Oregon, Minnesota, New Jersey, I think, is, is one of the recent ones. You said Colorado. So Maryland is one. So it, it was um, definitely, a, I think, an important um, illustration that the crisis on the ground is more important than what the political dynamics are because people were facing premium increases that no one could afford and I, that the Georgia example is just staggering. So what's neat about what Georgia's doing, what's very unique and why people are watching is last year the administration did put out new guidance about the waivers to kind of broaden what beyond just the reinsurance. Everyone was doing that and everyone does copycat stuff but they said let's do something new and they laid out some kind of concepts of ideas of, well, you, if you had more flexibility, what would you want to do? Here are some ideas. And to date, Georgia will be the only state that's actually seized upon it and is planning to submit something that's based beyond kind of the reinsurance mechanism and looking at exactly what you have described, which is not only how do we expand the coverage options that are available that people can shop for, but also how do we then reprogram the financing in a way that is more appropriate for the state to be doing rather than have it be done through um, Washington. And then also the third piece is that it's a combination waiver. I mean, I know you submit them separately, but 
I think that the state's done a really good job of explaining the kind of the continuum of care that they're trying to create, like the, the chart show. And I think that really lends itself to why this kind of combination um, is real important. On a kind of the broader national context and why I love coming to the states in general is because one, that is where the action is these days. One thing we recognize is no matter who you are in Washington these days, or anyone, uh, I think there's a recognition that the Affordable Care Act has been a failure. It doesn't matter if you're Republican or Democrat. If you're on the left, their solution is doubling down on more government. Well, we didn't regulate enough. Let's get back in there and do more. Hence why we have Medicare for all or what, you know, proxies to Medicare for all public options. Um, but then there are folks saying, no, it's the actual underlying restrictions that you put on the states that are causing all these problems and why waivers like the 1332 are so critically important because if we can get good experience to show, not in a theory like a Medicare for all single payer model, but to really show that premiums are, are coming down and choices are going up, that really puts kind of the fire under Congress to say, you need to do more. You're only working through the parameters of what the statute has. We've been working at Heritage and across um, with national leaders um, and state leaders and grassroots leaders to try to build a kind of consensus model proposal that's kind of built on this idea in, in very many similar ways of giving states more regulatory flexibility beyond what you can do now, um, as well as making sure that statutorily allowed for you to take the funding that's being flowed through um, the federal government to, to the insurance plans and actually take the money and give it to the states and let them to decide how they want to design the subsidies for their populations. We think it's so critical to get Congress to move, we've got to have pressure from the states to show that states can do this. This isn't, you know, something new to, for them. They really can do a better job in regulating their insurance market and helping those at the state level because certainly Washington is, is very detached on this. So I think that's why it's really exciting and hopefully with Georgia, others will, will um, follow suit and we can really show that there is there is power at the state level. And, and when you talk about that consensus group being led in large part by Heritage, I mean, you have an actual proposal uh, that, that would go farther than, than any of these waivers have gone. That's right. And really, the, the goal is to remove some of the uncertainty that I think that the governor's office probably is worried about is what is, what is the federal government going to say when they go up with the waiver. We really, with this proposal, would clearly state in statute that you don't have to worry about what the essential health benefit plans are. If you want to, if you want to change what the benefit plans are, you can do it. You can change the financing of it. So it's really, um, it is a plan, and we've been, we have over a hundred people who have signed on to the concept of it. Um, you can go to Healthcare Choices um, 2020, I think. .gov. Sorry, I'm not good with that. Not .gov. .org. Uh, or, or just send me an email. I can share more with you. <laughs> it's probably better. All right, so that's a lot about the ACA waiver. Um, if you could tell us a little bit about the Medicaid side, you know, there's been a lot of talk about Georgia seeking the enhanced match rate uh, of 90% federal funding, which was set um, by the ACA for Medicaid expansion. Uh, and, and Utah was denied that match rate for doing something less than full expansion. Um, and, and so there, there's a distinct possibility that Georgia uh, only gets the traditional match rate of about two to one. So uh, in talking with you, uh, it sounds like you think there might actually be some positive aspects to that, though. Yeah, well, the first thing is we shouldn't wash away all the great reforms that the state's trying to do within the 1115 waiver in the Medicaid program. Forget the financing. You know, money always comes after. You decide what you want to do, I kind of feel like. But um, there are a lot of great reforms in there. I think talking, uh, discussing about how you want people to experience what a real commercial market, it's so critical to teaching people how to move out of the safety net. Unless we're, I mean, unless you just feel that people should just stay on government throughout their lifestyle, which is what some on the left definitely want to do, is to say, you're on a government program, we'll keep you there from beginning to end. And that's what some of the proposals on the left would do. They would automatically enroll people when they're first born into a government program. Um, so I think that the underlying reforms of, of uh, premiums and cost sharing, um, leveraging employer-based insurance, those are all really fundamental policy changes that we that that should be encouraged um, at the state level 
Georgia's not the only one doing it. A lot of states have kind of realized that a one-size-fits-all Medicaid program doesn't work and that we need to treat populations differently. Now, on the, on the match rate, yes, I think the administration at this point, based on what I can read, I don't know anything more than anyone else, is they have seemed to indicate that a partial expansion doesn't qualify for the 90% match rate. Some people could probably make the legal argument that well, it's a mandatory population, and so therefore, you know, the rules are the rules. You have to abide by them to do it, and a partial expansion doesn't get you the full group. Um, but I think there is a case to be made of using a traditional match rate. First of all, it's no longer a mandatory population. So when you have mandatory populations, there are mandatory requirements that go with them. But by doing it um, under a traditional match rate, the population that you bring on can be a, an optional population. So you have a lot more flexibility of what kind of benefits they get, how you design the program around that group. Um, so I think that's a big piece. The other piece is the flexibility, just general flexibility of how the state is going to treat that population can be different than they do the traditional group. And that also, I think, leverages what the whole purpose of an 1115 waiver is. I think it strengthens the case to say, we want to test something new. We want to test putting on a new population that maybe it, it's not a mandatory, but we want to see how we could help low-income people, maybe in a gradual way, to see maybe over time do you add more benefits, do you, are there some benefits you're not offering that you should be but you don't need these. That's the flexibility that um, I think the states get, get from that. And then I would be really remiss if I don't um, say this, because I say this every time I go to the states. There's lots of talk when I go to these conferences, I haven't heard it here, where the states talk about all the savings they'll get because they're using the 90% match rate. And I try to gently point out to everyone in the audience that yes, you're Georgia taxpayers, but you're also federal taxpayers. And so the shift of money saying savings at the state, you're gonna be paying it out of the other pocket with federal taxes. So um, I do think over time, the crisis, no one thinks that we're in a deficit crisis today or a spending crisis. Um, but it comes in and out of fashion all the time, and I guarantee in the next five, ten years, there'll be another crisis in Washington. They'll pull together a super committee that's going to solve all the budget problems. And programs like Medicaid and Medicare and a lot of these um, uh, entitlement programs are on the table because that's where all the money is. And so I think that the 90% the, the match rate, besides all the, I think, uh, perverse incentive that it creates targeting some populations over others, um, does a disservice to what the Medicaid program should be, and I think it's probably unsustainable fiscally. And, and I would add, and I, I wrote this in a column that, that appeared this week, but you know, we've, we've heard some talk about, well, the state's going to spend $200 million for these waivers, or it could have spent $200 million for the Medicaid expansion and covered more people. And, and that's omitting the $3 billion in federal, in federal money that the Medicaid expansion would cost. The real cost of the expansion is 3.2 billion, not 200 million. Um, and you know, there's always the chance when that crisis hits that Congress will decide we're not picking up 90 percent anymore. You know, we're not gonna we'll pick up 80 percent or 70 percent, and then you're right back where you were, except the state has a much bigger price tag. Um, so, last one for Nina, and then and then we'll we'll move on back to our other panelists, but. From what we've seen with other waivers, what can we expect from here on out in the process? Are we likely to see a lawsuit as we've seen in some other states? You know, is Georgia's waiver different somehow? How would you analyze that? Well, I'd pick up on something Ryan said. I think there is an urgency for the administration, um, and because it's kind of a tandem waiver, um, while the clock is ticking on 1332s, they also really need a victory in 1332s, in my opinion. And to be able to have the tag along of the Medicaid piece, which in my opinion is not controversial from anything else they've approved, um, I hope that creates um, a sense of urgency for them because I think it, it, it would go a long way in making the case that they've been trying to make, which is state flexibility is the direction they want to go. Um, I have to say I do think lawsuits are kind of the new norm. Um, there's not a state that, that does something that someone hasn't filed a lawsuit on. And it's not just the work requirements. I mean, they will continue to beat down on anything that they think goes out of the norm of what they want the Medicaid program to be. Um, so I think not only, and, and I would be interested to see how they handle um, the 1115 waivers, I mean, uh, the 1332s. I think for sure, even though I think the state's done a good job trying to um, change the dynamics on the community engagement work requirements, I think that'll be an interesting test case to, to highlight. 
Um, but they're already attacking it anyway as being the same thing, so that will be an interesting case. And then I think on the 1332 side, I think there'll be some, I'll be curious to see if there are lawsuits around the um, uh, non-federally qualified health plans being available to use the subsidies, which I think those are the two that those on the left will probably zone in on the most. Not because um, I think that there's anything wrong with the states doing it. I don't think they're on legal grounds. I don't think they're doing it for legal purposes. They're doing it for uh, political purposes to, because they're opposed to the underlying policies of allowing people to have those kinds of choices. They say if it's not the kind of benefit plan we designed, then it's not good for you. Um, I think we think differently, that people sh have lots of different ideas of what they want to prioritize and what kind of benefits they want. So those are the only two things I would flag. Okay. All right, so back to Senator Kirkpatrick and something you said earlier. You talked about how you know this was not the end-all, be-all, and you mentioned other waivers, but you also mentioned things beyond waivers. Uh, and you had, another, you had a signature achievement this year also with your direct primary care bill. Tell us a little bit more about that what that means, how it could grow, how maybe it fits with some of this, and some other um, reforms that you think Georgia still needs to pursue. Well, there are a couple of really exciting things going on right now. One is that the lieutenant governor has a task force on um, innovation and technology in healthcare, basically, and we're just hearing some great presentations. I think there's gonna be some uh, interesting things that come out of that. The governor's office also now is going to be having an office of healthcare coordination and integration or something. It's got uh, a long name though. Anyway, and I think the combination of that's gonna help, but we, uh, Senate Bill 106 was really only one of 22 healthcare bills that we passed last year, and we've got a lot more work to do. We've got issues, serious issues with uh, drug pricing We've got uh, the complete lack of transparency that we're dealing with in healthcare compared to other businesses. We've got a lot of talk about telemedicine, and our law is conducive to telemedicine, but coordinating that and implementing that is the next challenge. So I think we have a lot more that we can accomplish over the next few years. I think the waiver's a great place to start, but there are other things happening at the same time that I think are gonna be very beneficial. I know price transparency is something that comes up a lot for people. Tell us, I'm not asking you to tip your hand on what, what a bill might look like, but tell us some of what that task force is hearing when it comes to price transparency and you know, maybe what other states are doing or ideas that people have put forward. You know, is, is there any hope here that we could see uh, something significant done on that? Well, I think one of the areas that is particularly interesting is the black box of uh, drug pricing and the role that the PBMs, the pharmacy benefit managers, play in that. We've heard some fascinating testimony on that, and we've also heard some great testimony from a group that demonstrates the variability in the pricing for the same procedure between facilities and is uh, working to provide employers with some tools to evaluate that further. Um, you mentioned uh, on a on a slightly different subject, you mentioned the direct primary care, and I'll just uh, speak about that for a minute. What that does is it allows patients and physicians to privately contract with each other outside of insurance for a very reasonable amount of money. And it's just another choice that people can have, and uh, if you either don't have insurance or your doctor goes out of network on your plan, it gives you another choice of uh, receiving primary care. So I think that is gonna already, it's already starting to be a game changer across the state. Right, right. Yeah, if you've been to our events in the past, you've heard people like Dr. Brian Hill or Dr. Lee Gross talk about direct primary care and, and, and what it can mean. Uh, surprise billing, is that is that something that, You'll, you'll hear a little bit about, maybe, uh, yeah. a few people complaining about so it. So surprise billing, just, I'm sure everybody's heard about it, but basically if you go to the emergency room, the hospital may be in your network, but the consultants may not be. The uh, emergency physician, the anesthesiologist, if you have surgery and so on, or the surgeon. And so everybody agrees that these bills that show up later are a big problem, and we've been working on that at the state level for three years before I got there, and we got really close to a solution this year, 
and the real argument is how the conflicts are resolved, and that is that discussion is also going on at the federal level. I think they're not doing very well at getting that resolved at the federal level, but um, I'm hopeful that this year will be the year we get that across the finish line and actually come up with something that's going to help the patients without destroying the uh, medical community. Uh, I have one more question uh, for the group, but I want you all to go ahead and, and know that it's time to start writing your questions on your note cards. I'm, I'm sure there are a lot out there about this topic because it is uh, so important and so new and, and, and really just uh, there's a lot to chew on here. So start writing those down. We'll, we'll have people collecting those. But uh, we talked with Senator Kirkpatrick about what may be next. Ryan, from the administration standpoint, um, I'm not... Uh, trying to get you to go from this one, um, you know, insomnia-fueled um, uh, <laughs> policy effort that you've been on for what 11 months now, uh, di directly to another one. But, but you know, what what are the, some of the other themes that we're going to hear from the governor and the governor's office on health care, and, and you know, whether it's uh, talking about the waiver, what complements the waiver, you know, what goes beyond the waiver. Sure. So one of my favorite things about working for Governor Kemp is that he keeps his word. Um, and the kind of tagline, and I'm going to screw this up, but what he'll say to folks is, if I said it on the campaign trail, I'm going to do it. And so if you go and look at, you know, KempForGovernor.com and go pull up his health care priorities from September of last year, that lays out a playbook of what the administration and the governor want to address in his first term. And that looks at things like surprise billing and price transparency, um, looking at issues that are, are tough issues to understand and kind of wrap your head around like maternal mortality and the opioid crisis. Um, so I think we'll, we'll begin to see that flesh out over the course of the next several months. Um, thankfully, the General Assembly has prerogative to drop bills and introduce legislation. And that'll give us a lot to talk about, I'm sure. Um, but our, our focus, you know, presently is to make sure that these waivers get approved and then actually turn around and implement them, which is a whole other task in and of itself. Uh, all right, so first question, the uninsured are heavily concentrated in small groups, employers uh, with fewer than 50 employees. Uh, how can the 1332 waiver help both individual and small group plans with lower premiums? That's, that's a good question. One of the, the key features of our Georgia Access model that I failed to mention um, at the onset is that under present federal law, and I think it's either IRS rule or Treasury law, um, there is a prohibition on combining a defined contribution from an employer to an employee and a federal subsidy under the Affordable Care Act together to be used to basically help purchase premiums. You can use one funding source or the other. But as a result of the state waiving its participation on healthcare.gov, the state will in effect be a, a capturer and the administer, administrator rather of about $2.7 billion worth of state subsidies that are presently available under the ACA. Well, the federal rule, I believe it is, only specifies that um, a contribution from an employer cannot be combined with a federal subsidy, but it doesn't say that about a state subsidy. So in our scenario under our Georgia Access Plan, an individual working for a small employer who the employer doesn't, isn't able to afford providing their employees coverage or some other scenario can offer that employee a defined contribution under the Trump administration's new rule um, for HRAs or some other mechanism and that individual, if they are between 100% of the poverty line and 400% of poverty line, is eligible for the state subsidy just like they are today. But they can then use both of those funding sources to be able to purchase premiums as a result, whereas under healthcare.gov and the ACA, they can only use one presently. So you mentioned the HRAs, and we did have a question about that. And so, Nina, maybe this is a good one for you. This is not the way it was phrased. It's the way I'm going to phrase it. Like, what's the big <laughs> deal with these HRAs? Why, why can they potentially have such impact and why, why are they uh, you know, potentially such a big tool? Well, I mean, I've been a long advocate of moving towards kind of a defined contribution model for health care. You know, if you look back in the employment-based system, we've shifted away from old-fashioned pensions to 401ks years ago. Why health care wasn't kind of caught up in that, I'm not sure. I should investigate. But it really is the next phase, which is, yes, is it nice to have your employer select a health care plan? You don't have to think about it correct. But you might, but in a mobile workforce that we have today, employer-based coverage that locks you in just there really doesn't make sense. And so the concept of defined contribution is that the employer just says, we'll give you some money. 
we might offer a plan and you could use it to buy into our plan, or if you want to, you could buy something on the not on through your new uh, state, not state plan, but your new gov, your new website, private website. Um, and I think that's really important to give people and give consumers and give um, workers more flexibility than they have today. If you're a part-time worker, you typically don't qualify for employer-based coverage. But guess what? You're probably you might be working 40 hours a week. You're just working for two different employers. Uh, so you don't qualify. Or um, you could be like my husband and I. We both work at the Heritage Foundation. Guess what? Heritage wins out because I'm on his family plan. I don't get anything from Heritage for my health care plan. But in a defined contribution model, we'd both be treated independently. And we could either buy together into the plan or we could buy outside of the plan. So the HRA rule really would begin to break down where the employer can provide you that contribution into an account of some sort, and then you get to decide how you want to allocate those resources. And even better, on the low income side, so that when you hit hard times, you're unemployed, why do you have to join on the Medicaid program? Why can't the government, the state government, provide you a subsidy to just make you sustain what you've already had? Why are we keep kind of bouncing people in and out? And the same would be true, I think, um, when people hit 65. Today, people have to join Medicare. There's no other option. This way, again, the government could continue to, to subsidize as they would be you buying into the Medicare program, but you as the consumer get to decide where those dollars go. Yeah, I just wanted to say uh, something about the difference for a consumer of having a Medicaid card and having a private insurance card. The access to physicians for folks on Medicaid uh, is not great, particularly for specialists, and it doesn't necessarily mean that just because you have a card you're going to be able to access care, whereas having private insurance with or without a subsidy expands the options for uh, doctors that are going to be willing to treat those patients. Yeah, that's a point that we've made as the foundation in the past. It's a little unclear as to exactly what percentage of physicians accept Medicaid and which ones don't, but everyone agrees, I think, that fewer physicians accept Medicaid patients than accept commercial insurance. All right, so this next one is a total shot across the bow, and we're going to take it, and we're going to let all three panelists uh, handle it if they would like, and it is simply, wouldn't Med Medicare for all fix all of this? <laughs> no. No, I mean, the cost of these proposals, I mean, you just look, I mean, the one thing you can say about uh, Senator Sanders, he's at least honest. And he says it's going to cost a lot of money and we're going to have to tax everyday Americans. I mean, that's what it is. Senator Warren, though, is trying to kind of have it both ways. Oh, I'm only going to tax the rich. But if you total up, we have estimates coming out that um, over three-fourths of, of, of people will pay more in taxes than they do today under that kind of a, of a model. And then you add on all the other great ideas. Forget health care. I think there's a green plan. There's an education plan. All of this, there's only so much money that can go around to pay for all these things. Um, so I get that they believe in theory that this is a good idea. I think it's raw. I mean, if you think we have it bad now, the lack of choice, the lack of um, actually having really personalized health care, I think is all totally diluted if you have the federal government running the health care system. And this is, I also think it goes in stark contrast with what the states are doing. And I'm not just talking red states. I follow a lot what's going on at the state level. There are a lot of innovative things happening in blue states and red states, purple states. All that goes away because the federal government is going to supplant everything that's happening on that, in those states. So any bit of innovation you want to bring to your state actually is going to be decided by the federal government. So I just think it's just fraught with, with unintended consequences, and I think it sounds good on a bumper sticker, but really hard to make happen in real life. So it, I can address this as a physician. Uh, Medicare was basically second only to Medicaid as being the lowest common denominator for physicians in terms of reimbursement. And uh, anybody tried to find a primary care physician who will take new patient, new Medicare patients lately? It's really problematic. And so it's really uh, l taking the excellence of the system that we have now mm -hmm. and bringing that down to a level that I think American citizens are not going to be willing to put up with. All right. Um, Will the waivers have a positive impact on independent contractors 
through association health plans. That's a good question. Um, <clears throat> So I'll take it in two parts. Will the waivers have a positive impact on independent contractors? Yes. Um, the notion, though, of association health plans, um, I, I'm not sure that our 1332 waiver would impact anything related to the association health plan, because that's under a USDOL rule and not under the Affordable Care Act. OK. Um, what is the future of high risk pools in the states? We've talked about reinsurance. It's another risk mitigation uh, policy. So high risk pools as opposed to reinsurance, what's the future of that in the states? Uh, the the uh, fact that under the ACA, there have only been single risk pools is the in, one of the main reasons that a lot of the carriers left the states. The, basically, they could not risk adjust the population and had to take all comers. And so the idea of reinsurance basically is a high risk pool. It's claims over a certain dollar amount are kicked into a separate category, which makes the um, calculations by the carriers much more favorable. This is another juicy one. Will Georgia ever get rid of the certificate of need <laughs> regulation? <laughs> If we have anything to say about it, yes. But what do our panelists have to say about it? I hope so. <laughs> well, we, we did, we tried this year. And um, we made some minor progress, I would say. We raised some of the thresholds. We expanded some of the um, uh, capability for some of the hospitals to do business that they weren't able to do under the tighter version of Certificate of Need. but. There are uh, powerful political forces at play that really limit this, and I really thought we got as close as we were going to get this year, and I know that people on both sides are very unhappy with the um, little bit of progress that we made this year. The one good thing that did come out of it is a transparency piece that has to do with the hospitals <coughs> disclosing their financials on their websites, and that was something new that was not central to the certificate of need debate. It was sort of a, um, an auxiliary thing that happened as a result. And, and I think that the governor believes, and, and certainly everybody in this room as well, I would hope, that certificate of need is anti-free market at its finest. Um, but thankfully, I'm not a member of the General Assembly, and I don't have the ability to draft legislation, but I don't think the conversation about certificate of need reform is done yet. It'll be back every year. <laughs> Are there occupational licensing or other regulation re regulatory requirements which, if removed, I guess, uh, might extend effective health care to underserved markets? Occupational licensing, of course, something we talked about a little bit earlier. So are there, are there, are there limitations on health care providers um, that, that might, if, if we remove them or relax them uh, somewhat, might, might help out with all this? Uh, I think I know where this question is going, but um, basically when you're talking about healthcare being highly regulated, and James said this at lunch, you're balancing with public safety all the time. And my feeling has always been that healthcare is a team sport, and we're realizing that more and more. <laughs> and so we have to all be working together, and we do need people working at the top of their license, but in coordination with other healthcare professionals. How do we achieve that? Maybe telemedicine is part of the answer, but uh, for areas of the state where the whole team, not all the members of the team are there. Well, I think technology is going to be the answer to that. That's how we're going to connect all the dots. All right. A few years ago, Georgia passed a law allowing the sale of insurance plans across state lines. How has that impacted the insurance market, if at all? Well, I'll take a stab. I can only assume that the Affordable Care Act made that null and void. Um, that once you federalize what the what the plans are, then there's no incentive to go to another state because they're selling the exact same plan design that's in your state. Um, but I don't know what, what the status is of that. All right. Can the state engage in a medical sharing program that is far less costly? 
is there a state role or, or in encouraging those, allowing broader use of them, that sort of thing? Well, um, I do know that the medical sharing programs are not currently regulated by the Department of Insurance and they are not a, an insurance plan. They're a cost sharing plan, they're what they say they are. And I think there's been some talk about bringing those plans under the supervision of the Office of Insurance, but I don't know what the status of that is right now. Do you want to? No, uh, that's an interesting question though, and, and I think Dr. Patrick is spot on. You know, MediShare and Health Sharing Ministries, the, the concept of it is not regulated like insurance is. It's, not, it's presently not regulated at all. It's a lot like direct primary care, where it's, it's an arrangement that exists between an individual and an entity. Um, so I'm not, I'm not sure where the state being a keeper of a health sharing program or a medical sharing program would fit into all of this, but I, I may be mistaken. Maybe another way of asking it would have been, since it's not an insurance product, was it something you could even consider including in a 1332 waiver was to allow people to use subsidies to buy it? No, because our, our Georgia Access Program um, will only only allow individuals to see products that are regulated as insurance and approved by the Department of Insurance on that platform. So it's everything that is considered insurance with the exception of direct primary care and MediShare arrangements. Uh, and Kyle, I will say that um, the new insurance commissioner, Commissioner King, um, has become aware of some problems that consumers have had with some of those plans not being able to cover the uh, costs, and I think there may have even been a warning letter or two go out. Okay. This is the last one I have for now. If anyone has another question, now's the time to raise your hand with it. But uh, what can be done to allow consumers to truly price comparison shop for procedures? With high deductible and copays, consumers need true transparency in pricing from providers. So what can be done? Um, it seems like a very straightforward, it would be a very straightforward thing. It's really complicated because uh, there's a sort of a charge master amount and then there's the amount that is uh, per contract with either a private insurance company or with the government payers. And so what is the price? And I think that hospitals and doctors are challenged with trying to actually figure out what something costs them and that makes it very difficult to get to transparency but we've got to go there because more and more people have high deductible plans and they do need to be able to get some idea and right now it's uh, if you call and try to get a price on anything you're pretty much out of luck so I think there are some companies that are doing some innovation around that. There's one that presented to our group called Healthcare Blue Book that shows the variability uh, between different facilities. And they also um, use quality measures. And you can put that together with the price and figure it out. But it's more really for employers at this point rather than consumers. But I think there will be innovation in that area and we'll see uh, that happening over the next few years. I would just add too that the administration is coming out today with a big, with two transparency proposals. Um, so I think it is, it's, they're gonna have to really play out and we're gonna have to see what consumers gravitate for and what works and what doesn't. I think we, I think you're right to say we'll have to kind of be cautious about how it rolls out um, and it'll take time. And I think in my opinion, the more the states are involved in it too, the more folks can learn from it. So you'll have one state doing something and another state doing something else and maybe best practices will finally get us to the point of saying, okay, this is really how you good transparency policies could be. All right. Any closing thoughts from the panel? Uh, go dogs, first of all. Um, <laughs> the game tomorrow. Um, but no, I, I really appreciate you guys sitting here and, and listening through this with us today. I, I think one of the things that I would encourage all of you to do um, is go take a look at both of the waiver applications that are on the governor's website and the DCH website. Um, there is a plethora of information that we didn't get to today and, and I could spend you know, 14 hours talking to your off about over the course of the next day or so, but they're 
truly innovative proposals that the federal government has never seen before in the history of both 1115 and 1332 waiver authority. So we're, we're excited about that and we're committed to seeing this through. I think the administration, from what we've been able to gather over the course of the last couple of weeks, is excited as well. Um, but there are other things not related to waivers, kind of like we talked about at the beginning, that need to be addressed outside of what waiver authority allows us to do. And I'm looking forward to working with each of you and the panelists up here and Kyle, you as well, over the course of the next three years to really move the needle on healthcare reform in Georgia. Um, if anyone wants to see the presentations that have been made to the Lieutenant Governor's Healthcare Task Force, those were live streamed and they are available. You can just search <laughs> Lieutenant Governor Healthcare Task Force and uh, you'll be able to find it. I think you might enjoy it. Anything from you, Mark? All right. Well, let's thank our panel.